Warning, this review will contain spoilers for the Eye of the World. The journey was long already, but the epic has hardly even begun. The Great Hunt, the second book in the Wheel of Time series, starts off a little while after the end of the first book, and the party has reconvened at the Fortress of Faldara. Lan is giving Rand sword fighting lessons, Nynaeve and Egwene are coming to terms with the Aes Sedai life, and Moraine meets with the Amralin Seat, the leader of the Aes Sedai, telling her what she discovered at the end of the first book, all while dark forces are gathering both locally and abroad. Despite events from the last book, Rand still wants to go home, and he's under the impression that the Amralin Seat is coming to Faldara so she can gentle him. But when he's actually brought before the Flame of Tarvalin, it turns out that's not the case at all. In fact, she tells him something that the reader has probably known since the middle of the first book. Rand is the Dragon Reborn, the prophesized hero destined to save the world from the Shadow. Rand doesn't believe this and goes into hardcore denial. Part of that is the general distrust of Aes Sedai and their schemes, but a lot of it is also due to the fact that, thanks to the Dark One's taint on Sidene, Rand will most likely go mad and kill everyone he loves if he becomes the dragon. In his denial, and arrogance, Rand also believes that he was able to kill the Dark One at the end of the first book, and he shouts the Dark One's true name, thinking nothing bad will happen. Big mistake. A horde of Trollocs attack Faldara, and a mysterious figure named Padon Fane has singled out Rand as his enemy, and is working with the Trollocs, taking a chest with two very important magical objects contained inside. One being the Horn of Valir, said to call a host of legendary heroes back from the grave to fight for whoever blows it, and will be instrumental in defeating the Shadow when the last battle comes. If the Shadow gets it instead, it would be very bad for obvious reasons. The other is a dagger Matt took from the cursed city of Shadar Logoth in the first book. In said book, there was a moment when the party visited the city of Shadar Logoth in order to escape from a Trolloc horde, and Matt made the idiot's move of taking a dagger from the city after Moraine told him not to touch anything. The dagger then corrupted Matt's mind and drove him mad for much of the book until Moraine was able to heal him just enough to grant him his self-control back, but is unable to heal him completely until she can join with more Aes Sedai and fully separate him from the dagger. Unfortunately, if Matt remains apart from the dagger for too long, he'll die. So Rand begrudgingly agrees to go with the search party along with Matt and Perrin to hunt down the Trollocs and take the horn and the dagger back. But he's also still hell-bent on not becoming the dragon and going home once this is over. Meanwhile, Nynaeve, Egwene, now joined by Elaine, a young noblewoman who Rand met in the first book and is the same level of channeling potential as Egwene, now go to Tarvalin to finish their training as Aes Sedai. Those are two very separate plot lines for most of the book, so let's tackle them one by one. The main plot of the book is the Hunt for the Horn. It is what the book is named after. And the biggest part of that is Rand coming to terms with his destiny now that he knows what it is. Now, I've seen a lot of people say that Rand is a boring character for the first three to four books, and frankly, I can see what they're talking about in the first book, but not this one. Rand adamantly refuses the call of destiny when it is thrust upon him at first, and he comes to accept it fully over the course of the book. Starting out with no desire beyond just helping his friends, but in doing so, he finds himself needing to channel in order to do so, and by this invocation, accepting that he's the dragon if it means saving those he cares about. Each time, he puts up less resistance, and by the end of the book, he finally has it through his system and now is fully on board with being the Dragon Reborn. But he's not the only character who needs to accept his destiny in order to make a difference. Perrin has his fair share of development in this regard as well. He has continued developing his abilities to talk to wolves and enter the world of dreams, but as a bonus, he's also started developing some wolf-like tendencies. Some of these are just enhanced senses, but they also come with a personality shift that he thinks could be draining away his humanity. Unlike Rand, who fully embraces his abilities by the end of the book, Perrin needs more time to find a balance between man and wolf to make sure he doesn't lose himself, all while leveraging his abilities to keep the hunt going. But that isn't going to be easy. There are a whole menagerie of dark forces at work within this series, who are enacting everything from petty revenge schemes to grand plans, and in this book, this is where that starts to become more apparent. More specifically, the standout here is Padon Fane. He was in the first book, and it's implied that he's been behind multiple massive Trolloc attacks, but this is when he steps into the limelight. 
He travels with the Trollocs, keeping the magic items close by, and actively trolls Rand by leaving him messages and showing up to screw him over at the worst possible times, snatching a potential resolution from the main character's hands and forcing them to take more drastic measures in order to catch up with him. We actually get a few moments that are told from his perspective, and we get to see just how twisted he really is, even when surrounded by his supposed allies. Now, while I'd love to keep talking about the hunt, I need to move on to the Aes Sedai plot eventually, so here we go. Nynaeve had a few character perspective chapters in the first book, and while she doesn't have as many here as she does later in the series, this is where the series really starts to move away from being just about Rand. Nynaeve sort of becomes the de facto leader of the girls as they go off on their own adventures. She's the most powerful channeler from among them, and the first to be raised to the Accepted, which is the intermediate step between novice and full Aes Sedai. That is, despite her having a psychological block preventing her from channeling unless she is angry. This largely being due to the fact that female channelers need to surrender themselves to Saidara in order to channel it, and Nynaeve never surrenders herself to anyone or anything without being angry. And this applies to any authority figures she meets as well. The Amarlin Seed is considered one of, if not the most powerful political figure in the world, and Nynaeve cannot have a single conversation with her without resisting. The other two girls simply follow along and are enamored with becoming full Aes Sedai, and things are mostly stable, well, until spoilers happen. The girls are then wrapped up in a complex game of power play that puts all of them through the ringer in one way or another, most notably for this book, Egwene. This moment in the story is where Egwene's character arc in the series truly begins. She's beaten down in a very hostile environment and is completely on her own for a big section of the book. The experience leaves her with some understandable anger, but also a new drive. She goes from just wanting to be Aes Sedai because she thinks it's cool and it boosts her ego, to setting out with a more concrete idea of what she actually wants to do with her life. But I'll get to that later. There are a few other characters and plot points of note in this book, most notably Loyal, who is still the only cinnamon role in this series of moral greatness. Loyal serves as a guide for the party, even in the most irregular of situations, and his knowledge proves invaluable when it comes to the more fantastical or historical situations. We even get to see a steading in this book, one of the places that the Ogier live in. It's an opening in the trees with one big tree above it all, and one of the women is eyeing Loyal. Quick side note, the Ogier are a matriarchal society, and the mothers decide basically everything when it comes to relationships, so Loyal thinks that this could force him into a marriage. Luckily for Loyal, though, he doesn't have to think about that right now. An Aes Sedai who's helping the search party says that Loyal is acting as their guide, and he needs to come with them, so the elders decide to let him off the hook for the time being. Matt, despite being with the party the whole time, doesn't have much to contribute this time around. But don't worry, he's one of my favorite characters in this series, and minor spoiler warning, I'll get to him a bit more in the next book. That's it for our main crew, but there are a few other characters I'd like to at least touch on. Kieran is a minor character that I liked a lot more than I thought I would. He's one of few characters in the series with an alternative magic ability. Specifically, he's a sniffer, meaning he has the ability to sense violence, which is useful when you're following a horde of Trollocs. But he's also fiercely loyal. Probably more so than he should be, considering he's one of the first people who recognizes Rand as someone of note, and seems incapable of not referring to him as Lord Rand, even when Rand himself specifically tells him not to do so. He also tells Rand all about the royal politics of the world, again, much to the budding Chosen One's chagrin. But it's usually for the best. He's a good guy, and he's there for you when it counts, but he can only do so much. And then there's Ingtar, who acts as the de facto leader of the search party, and he's surprisingly good at keeping a level head with all the crazy stuff that keeps happening, and all the off-the-wall stuff that keeps happening around Rand, Matt, and Perrin. Almost too level-headed, all things considered, but he does have his reasons. The final character of note here is Min. She, like Huron, also has an alternative magic ability that isn't tied to one of the big magical forces in the world like the One Power or the World of Dreams. She can see visions that foretell the future. She did appear in the first book, telling Rand something that the reader had been suspecting for a while, and in the rest of the series, she appears all over the place giving characters visions that offer vague approximations of what is going to happen. This usually leaves the characters with a lot of questions, and they, like the reader, don't understand what they mean most of the time until later. Sometimes, several books later. This is one of the many factors that would enhance a second read-through of the series. Well, I think. 
I spent two years of my audiobook time on this series, and I'm not sure I want to take that journey again with all the other books in my TBR. The Great Hunt, similar to The Eye of the World, does a fair bit of world building on the cities the characters visit, and in this case, I'd say there is even more payoff since, for one particular city, it ends up factoring into the plot much more so than any random city visited by the characters in the first book. The real interesting world building and setup comes from the societies that are introduced. First is the Aiel. They are a desert-dwelling warrior society that lives in a desert just over the mountain range east of the mainland where most of the story takes place. And they have quite the history with the people of the Westlands. Yes, I'm calling it that because Randland sounds stupid. And by history, I mean they went to war with the Westlands over a broken promise. And needless to say, they fight hard. But the biggest shakeup to the balance of the world introduced in this book is the Shan Shan. They are a mostly unstoppable force of a conquering empire. They enslave women who can channel and train them to become weapons of war. And if that wasn't enough to surpass most military forces in the Westland, they also have exotic creatures capable of flight, highly trained warriors, and genius tacticians that can overcome just about any loss. Needless to say, they're going to be quite the force in this series, but again, I'll save that for later. Alright, now for the climax. If there's one thing Robert Jordan was very good at doing in a book, well, besides well-made world-building and cultures, intricate magic systems, slow burn but compelling character arcs, it would be incredible climaxes to cap off each book. Most of the time. This wasn't really the case in the first book. Well, the climax of that book wasn't bad, but this one is outstanding. Several plot threads from the two groups of main characters come together to put the tension of the story as well as the scale and stakes of the plot at their highest, and the payoff here is just phenomenal. We get dramatic shifts for all the main characters and the world at large in the first, and most certainly not the last, epic fantasy battle of the series. In other words, everything you could possibly want in a climax to a book like this. When I was first reading the book, this was the moment when I first realized the kind of series that I was reading. Final thoughts. The Eye of the World was a great introduction to the characters and world, but The Great Hunt is the first of many steps up that the series takes in terms of character, world, and scale. However, just like the first book, it is still not quite as good as some of the later books. Still pretty great though, even in the wider scope of the series. It is A tier for me. Definitely a favorite, just not the best of the Wheel of Time series as a whole. So if you've read the book, what did you think of it? Whatever your thoughts, feel free to leave a comment. Until next time, the Mythos Archives are always open.